Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, will Vladimir Putin escalate his war in Ukraine? More than two weeks into a war he expected to dominate in two days. U.S. intelligence officials estimate Putin is projecting anger and frustration at the failures of his military and a willingness to cause even more violence and destruction. Iran claims responsibility for a missile barrage that hit near a U.S. consulate in northern Iraq Sunday. So what will this mean for Iran's nuclear deal, which has come under heavy criticism for being too weak? Plus, the war on Ukraine could become a source of a bigger alliance between Russia and China. Russia the bear and China the dragon are looking at a way to undermine the United States on the edges of their spheres of influence. We'll take a closer look, and then later, New data suggests the Texas heartbeat bill may not be effective. This is an agenda-driven uh, push to try to get pro-life lawmakers and pro-life activists around this country to take our ball and go home. All these stories and more are coming up next from the CBN Newsroom. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin with Russian forces keeping up their campaign to capture the suburbs of Kyiv, Ukraine's capital. But with Vladimir Putin's war not going as planned, some U.S. officials are worried he's about to escalate the battles. Dale Hurt has the story. U.S. officials are worried Russian President Vladimir Putin could use more extreme measures to break Ukraine's resistance, including a false flag attack with chemical weapons. Part of the reason that we're so concerned that this may happen is that when Russia starts accusing other countries of potentially doing something, it's a good tell that they may be on the cusp of doing it themselves. A Russian strike on a base used by NATO and U.S. troops in the past to train Ukrainian forces near the town of Yavoriv on the Polish border raised concerns Putin's actions could widen the war. We take our Article 5 commitment very seriously. An armed attack against one is considered an armed attack against all. Just a few days ago, uh, we repositioned two Patriot batteries from Germany into Poland. Top aides from the U.S. and China are meeting in Rome today amid reports that Russia recently asked China for military assistance to help press its campaign. We are communicating directly, privately to Beijing that there will absolutely be consequences Ukraine now says Russia is targeting city mayors after one was killed and this surveillance footage shows another being marched out of city hall by Russian soldiers. The Russians installed a replacement. As Russian forces pound cities and target civilian populations, Ukrainian President Zelensky is again pleading for a no-fly zone. If you don't yep. close our sky, Zelensky says, it's only a matter of time before Russian missiles fall on NATO territory. In the suburbs of the capital, Kyiv, this volunteer, one of many to help defend Ukraine, painted a grim picture of the fighting. Chaos. It was bombs coming from, like, left and right. You're just praying to God it doesn't land near you. In the midst of the carnage, Ukrainian civilians are trapped and under fire. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Our senior international correspondent, George Thomas, is with us now from the capital city, Kyiv. So, George, you arrived in Kyiv last night. Tell us about the journey there and what it is like right now. Uh, yeah, I uh, basically I was in the province uh, that's west to, uh, of, of the capital city, Kyiv. It's called Zhitomer. Uh, province and the the Russians have been trying to come uh, 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 attack the uh, the western part of uh, of the capital Kiev through Zhitomer and I was in a small village about five thousand in population and the Russians were about fifteen miles from my position and that uh, on Sunday evening the local pastors uh, Ephraim in that area told their wives and children, they need to leave. And so many of them decided to head west. And then uh, uh, yesterday evening, uh, instead of going straight across uh, into Kiev, into the capital city, we had to go all the way north uh, because if we went straight across, we would run right into the Russians. And that would not be a very good idea. So we went north uh, and then went back up north, uh, so rather went down south and then went back up north uh, into Kiev. And interestingly enough, I thought that the entry into the southern, from the southern part of Kiev would be heavily fortified. And I was actually quite surprised. It wasn't. Uh, you could really tell that they were beginning to make preparations, uh, put up concrete barriers and, and sandbags and everything. Uh, but, uh, but I think, you know, they have a sense of confidence in the south that they have complete control. And probably in the days and weeks ahead, 
they will fortify that entryway uh, uh, from the southern part uh, into Kyiv. Now, before getting there, you spent several weeks in Lviv, that's western Ukraine. Want to get your reaction to Russia's missiles attack near the Polish border. Uh, look, I, I, as you mentioned, I've been there for three weeks uh, until I moved here to Kyiv uh, this weekend. But, uh, I, you know, I was expecting that to happen. At some point, it was just a message to show Ukrainians that uh, all of Ukraine is under uh, under war. I mean, obviously, the emphasis has been over the last three weeks has been in Kyiv and in the eastern part of the country. Uh, but this particular attack over the weekend hitting not too far from the Polish border. In fact, I was there last uh, about a week and a half ago doing the story about there are hundreds of thousands of refugees continuing to flee across Poland. They hit a Ukrainian military base where U.S. Uh, troops as well as NATO troops had been there uh, in the past, training and so forth. So this is really sending a signal not just to Ukrainians living in the western part of the country that uh, you are not too far from the reach of the Russians, but it's also sending a message to Poland and to to the larger NATO uh, alliance to say, listen, uh, you know, you continue to ship in your, your, your weapons uh, into Ukraine, uh, you can be a potential target. And obviously, that was the message, in my opinion, that they sent by hitting that military target not too far from, uh, from the border with Poland. Mm. We see the activity where you are right now, and you are at a prominent evangelical church in Kyiv. Tell us about their humanitarian efforts. Yeah, I tell you what, talk about brave, being very, very brave. This church, Ephraim, is about five miles from the Russians in that direction. That is Erpin, that is Bucha. They're about five miles from there. But what they've been doing over the last 17, 18 days is literally they are, you know, gathering clothes from around the world. They're getting food. You're seeing folks here who are coming in. They're, they've got, they're sorting through, you know, what they have. They can look at uh, clothes that they can get. They've got shoes. And in this part uh, of, the, of the warehouse, there's food being put into different packages. You've got onions. You've got potatoes. Folks here gathering it all up to get it to the areas that are under fire uh, by the Russians or are in control. So you can just see the church of the body of Christ here at Grace Church doing what it's supposed to do, even in the midst of war. Mm, beautiful to see the church being the hands and feet of Jesus. Thank you so much. Our international correspondent, George Thomas, reporting for us from Kyiv today. I want to let you know that you can help be the hands and feet of Jesus by helping Operation Blessings relief efforts in this terrible war and humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. Call 1-800-700-7000 and say you want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. Or you can write us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Simply write Disaster Relief Fund in the memo on the check. You can also text us. Just text OB Crisis to 71777. Or you can go to our website, cbn.com, or Operation Blessing's website, ob.org. Anything you do, anything, is sincerely appreciated. Iran is claiming responsibility for launching a missile barrage that er, from Iran that hit near a U.S. consulate complex in northern Iraq. It happened Sunday. And as CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports, this has greater ramifications for the pending Iranian nuclear agreement. Iran state television claimed the missile strike targeted two Israeli spy centers in retaliation for an Israeli airstrike in Syria that killed two Iranians. Once again, we warn the criminal Zionist regime that repeating any evil acts will be followed by harsh, decisive and destructive responses. No injuries were reported in Sunday's attack, but the Iraqi government condemned the incident as a violation of international law and norms. Despite Iran's declaration, the attack represents an escalation in U.S.-Iranian tensions. The Iranians are striking against the United States over and over again and with zero reaction from the Biden administration. But former State Department official Eli Kohenim says the absence of a U.S. reaction seems to be related to nuclear talks in Vienna. What I am deducing from this pattern from the Biden administration is almost a cover up for the Iranian regime's actions because they are so dead set on re-entering the JCPOA 2015 Iran deal. The Wall Street Journal reports the U.S. won't agree to exempt Russia from Ukraine related sanctions in order to save the deal. The revived deal would relieve sanctions against Iran, giving them billions of dollars 
that experts say could be funneled to terror groups. Three years from now, it will remove restrictions, which would allow Iran to become a threshold nuclear state. It will have enough enriched uranium to create dozens and dozens of nuclear bombs, and it will have the ICBMs to deliver them to any place in the United States. That is unbelievable. It's not merely unacceptable. It endangers not only my country, Israel, but your country, the United States, and the entire world. One thing that history has shown us is that when genocidal dictators like Adolf Hitler, like the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, when they say that they want to commit genocide against the Jews, we need to believe them. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, China is still proclaiming its friendship with Moscow despite the world's most condemn the world condemning Russia's war on Ukraine. Find out what this could mean for the U.S. right after this short break. We'll be right back. Father, we thank you. The church in Ukraine is on fire. To see the church come alive in the middle of a war is tremendous. Lord, I pray that you would give them the resources to meet the physical needs of their countrymen. Give them the strength, give them the wisdom, give them the boldness to continue to preach the love of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Russia's war on Ukraine could open the door to greater global conflict. A new axis of evil led by Russia and China is determined to control the world's technology and commerce. Gary Lane brings us the details on this story. Within hours of invading Ukraine, Vladimir Putin made an urgent phone call to Beijing. He wanted to discuss his actions with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Not only did Xi know about the invasion in advance, Western intelligence officials say the Chinese requested Putin delay military action until after the Beijing Olympics. Russia obliged. This revelation indicates a strengthening of the Sino-Russian alliance and suggests the potential for President Xi to rely on his Russian partner for additional help. So is he preparing to pounce on Taiwan? Certainly he's watching what happens in Ukraine and certainly how the rest of the world uh, reacts to it. I think uh, Putin went to China in order to get Xi's blessing for the invasion. And perhaps a nod toward closer cooperation. Both presidents know Russian success in Ukraine is necessary for the alliance to make more significant gains. Russia the bear and China the dragon are looking at a way to undermine the United States on the edges of their spheres of influence. If the Russians extend their area of hegemonic influence over Eastern Europe, China backs it. The Chinese will look towards the Russians for support for a potential invasion of Taiwan, an expansion of their hegemonic interests towards Southeast Asia. Greg Roman is director of the Middle East Forum. Both countries, I, I think wrongly, but they both feel threatened by the U.S. dominance in the region, and now they're pushing back. If they work together, they're more likely to think that they'll succeed. But I think the U.S., by the time it starts confronting these two theaters, should wake up and realize that it's time to contain Russia and China. And at the end of the day, the Russians and the Chinese have a historical grievance that goes back hundreds of years. And that might upset the apple cart. For now, in order to aid their pursuit for Russian energy and Chinese money, certain countries are joining this new Sino-Russian-led axis. That includes Pakistan, whose Prime Minister Imran Khan met with Putin just hours before the Ukraine invasion, even though war was imminent. His high-level Moscow visit was Pakistan's first of its kind in more than 20 years. Hudson Institute senior fellow Robert Spalding suggests why timing of this convergence is troubling. Ukraine plus Russia plus China plus China's Belt and Road Initiative, so all the satellite states, to include countries like Iran and North Korea and others that are along the Belt and Road Initiative makes them incredibly powerful, not just militarily, not just from a nuclear weapon perspective, but also economically, financially, and increasingly technologically. American ally Taiwan would be a rich target. It has plenty of wealth and technology, currently accounting for 60% of the world's semiconductor revenue.
A coordinated military invasion of the island would give the members of this alliance dominance over the global microchip industry. That could prove devastating to the U.S. defense industry, which relies heavily on its allies' tech. A Taiwan Semiconductor is the best chip manufacturer in the world today. It's no longer American companies. It is TSMC. Now, the good news is they've started to build a fab in Arizona. Uh, so, you know, part of what we would be doing in the response to a, a potential invasion by China would be relocating the engineers and scientists that work on chips and as many of the people of Taiwan that would like to, you know, leave uh, before the invasion begins. Concerns over this anti-American axis extend far beyond Taiwan and advanced Chinese military capabilities. North Korea, a longtime member, continues to threaten its neighbors with missile launches, and Iran may soon possess a nuclear weapon. Technology experts also warn that China's advances in artificial intelligence already exceed those of the United States. It's a really a fundamentally different world, and the, and the tragedy of it all is that we help them build it. And we're not doing a lot to advance our own, are we? This has been growing. Uh, we knew it was happening. We just we wanted to hope or wish it away, kind of like Chamberlain and, uh, and others of his ilk uh, during World War II. And the Ukrainian pushback against the Russians may be the wake-up call needed to spur the United States and its allies to respond resolutely to this new and dangerous axis of evil threat. Gary Lane, CBN News. Still ahead, a closer look at new data regarding the Texas abortion law that took effect last year. Stay with us. Last fall, many wondered what would happen to the abortion rate in Texas after the state's heartbeat bill went into effect. The New York Times reported recently in the law's first month, abortions dropped by 50 percent over the previous year. That data coming from the University of Texas. The Times reported the decline was less than many expe experts expected and cited other research showing women do pursue out-of-the-state abortions when their own state has heavy restrictions. Americans United for Life is one of the top pro-life groups in the country working to craft laws that reduce abortion. I had the spell cell spoke with them about what's happening in Texas and across the country. Joining us now is Katie Glenn, Government Affairs Council for Americans United for Life. Katie, thanks for joining us. I want to ask you, the country is really gearing up for this Supreme Court decision uh, this summer on the Dobbs case. And there's, of course, new conversation around uh, the possibility of a post-row world. We've now got apparently two studies that show in Texas a law that outlawed abortion after the heartbeat is detected may not have prevented as many abortions as originally thought. Uh, perhaps women were traveling out of state or ordering abortion pills online. What is your take on what has happened in Texas and how much it's accomplished uh, this new law uh, in regards to the abortion rate there? Well, I think the first thing we need to remember is that these studies are not based on government collected data. These are surveys of abortion clinics. So until we receive actual numbers from the states, one of them that they include is Colorado, which currently their numbers are 40% off the state's numbers versus the pro-abortion group numbers. So I think we need to just know as long as we're not getting this from the government, we cannot trust this data. This is an agenda-driven uh, push to try to get pro-life lawmakers and pro-life activists around this country to take our ball and go home. They're trying to convince us that laws don't work when we know over the last 50 years that they do as we have cut the abortion rate in this country in half. Well, I want to ask you, uh, th this is what you, your work right now, what you are doing, working with states around laws, around abortion. If a state wants to prevent abortions, what in your view at this point in time is the most effective way to do so? Well, we're excited to see states thinking boldly about ways to uh, limit abortion at gestational age. Where I live here in Florida, there's a bill on Governor DeSantis's desk that would limit abortion to the first 15 weeks, the same law that's in front of the Supreme Court right now. We have over 3,000 late-term abortions in our state every year after that 15-week mark. I think a lot of people don't know that. So all of those lives would be saved. Uh, maybe some of these women would travel to Colorado or to New York, but many of them wouldn't. And we need to keep our eye on the ball that every life saved is a victory. Mm. 
And with respect to uh, women who are pursuing abortion pills online, what do you think are the best legal remedies, remedies to counter that? Well, states are th uh, thinking critically about this. They're taking it seriously. Last year, I was in Texas working with their lawmakers on a bill that did pass um, where they can actually now extradite these companies that are sending pills into Texas. And we really encourage them to do that now that we're getting evidence that they are. Um, that's something that these studies rely on very heavily is the number of women who reach out to these websites. The thing about these online pill mills is we have no idea who's actually ordering these drugs or who's actually taking them. It's part of why they are so dangerous. So when they rely on the number of Google searches for this website, that's not meaningful data for how many women are actually getting abortions. Hmm. If the Dobbs case overturns Roe v. Wade, uh, what does the legal landscape look like at this point in time? What are you preparing for? Well, we're looking at those laws that could take effect right now. Um, I've been traveling all over the country speaking with lawmakers about the laws that they have already passed that have been held up by the courts because of these bad decisions. And we want them to get back into court to take those laws into effect. Uh, we've got two states this fall that have a constitutional amendment for life on the ballot. So voters in Kentucky and Kansas will be able to go and vote for life. And we would encourage other states to look at that as well if they don't currently have that in their law. A big year for the pro-life movement. Uh, Katie Glenn with Americans United for Life, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Stay with us. Your Monday Motivation is coming up next. As we begin yet another busy week in the world of news, we do want to share a word of encouragement. We like to call it your Monday motivation. Here's a reminder for you. You are stronger than you think. You are God's creation. You are the work of his hands. You are his masterpiece. He breathed his air into your lungs and he loves you. With that word in your heart, make this a marvelous Monday and be sure to have yourself a wonderful rest of the week. That will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel at any time, as well as online at CBNNews.com. We'd love to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. Make it a marvelous Monday. I look forward to seeing you right back here, same time tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.